I'll just get started. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming to this session. Uh, lovely to see you all. Just want to say I'm recording this session and I think I'll upload it to YouTube afterwards. Um, I have a, about 900 subscribers, so I don't worry if your camera's on. It's not going to like go viral. Um, maybe like a couple hundred people might watch it. Probably other students from this year. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I yeah lovely to see you all thank you to who has the camera on and yeah I will just get started with a quick introduction and then I'll move over to explaining the structure of this tutorial and yeah so most of you know I'm Julie I was a, a property lawyer first and then I started working in litigation uh, but yeah, six months ago, you might have heard I moved to Queensland, a place called Mackay, and um, I am a full-time mum currently. I have a six-month-old daughter and a nearly three-year-old son, and I also run Julie Schmidt Law, which most of you probably know of. Um, yeah, so I was top of 13 papers while studying at AUT, so people started emailing me asking to buy my notes like complete strangers and I was sort of doing this email thing for like a, maybe two years and then I was like you know what I'll just make a website and see what happens and yeah I did that a couple months ago and it's pretty it just sort of exploded so it was really exciting and yeah I love being able to still have a contribution and help students even though I'm a full-time mom and yeah I just I really enjoy it so I sell my study notes here are the notes that we will be covering today. These are the torts notes. Um, yeah, these notes are very good, in my humble opinion. These are probably some of my best notes. I think I was trying to think how long they took me to make. And I was thinking at least two solid working weeks, like maybe 80 hours, because just every sentence you read, I just put so much time into crafting to make sure it was as short as possible, but as accurate as possible um so yes yeah, students who have bought these in the past I keep a lot of I keep tabs on people and like how do they go how do you find them in the exam and I've heard a lot people say I accredit these for getting from going from a b to an a just the cases I was able to reference and cite while in my exam um yeah and the way it's structured it's not a cheat sheet it's just the way it's structured helps people learn the law. So anyway, that's where the notes are. And also I've made this guide recently on how to structure answers to legal problem questions. I was asked this question a lot. Um, so I'm just going through muting someone. I was asked this question a lot during other tutorials that I taught. And I was like, God, this is such a long answer. I can't answer it in like a three minute um like session in this uh, question space. So I decided to make a guide and this has been super popular. I've received really good feedback on this guide as well. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, I have a model answer in this guide and the model answer is to the question that we're gonna be covering today. So if you wanna see the written, how it's written out, um, that is where you can find it. And I based the question today and the model answer on a real question that I answered, which I received 100% for, because I wanted to make sure it was good. Like if you're gonna provide a model answer, it better be like good. So um, yeah, I got 100% in that answer. So you can know it's good. All right, so that is that. Okay, the structure of today's session, I just want to spend the next like 10 minutes just roughly going over the subject um, and just giving you like a the gist of things. I think especially the word torts, there are a lot of similarities and differences that would be good to cover. After that, we're going to go over the problem question, which I hope everyone has had the chance to read. I'll just upload it um, in this chat if you want to have a quick skim now, if you haven't had the chance to read it. And while I'm here, I'll also upload a document with some information 
such as I, I made a discount code for you guys, which is good till midnight tonight. If you want any of the notes on my website, it's torts 10 off. So that's in that document. Okay. And then where was up to? Oh, tangents. All right. And then the final 15 minutes, I'll answer questions from the audience. But feel free to jump in in probably best in the group chat so I can get to it like um at some point rather than breaking my chain of thought or like chuck the hand up. And for all those who have joined late, I'm recording this session and I think I'll upload it to YouTube. And yeah, if you have YouTube, please subscribe. I'm trying to build up my YouTube presence. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and I'll go to my notes. All right, so torts. Oh, let me take a sip of my tea. Torts is one of my favorite subjects. I love torts. I'm very excited to be talking to you guys about torts. Um, okay, so I studied at AUT. I know we have people from all over New Zealand, different universities. Um, so I'll just explain. At AUT, we our second semester, we focused on land torts, word torts, and privacy torts. Um, I've added this. I've read some cases on Tikanga. I won't talk about it today but that's in there okay so yeah I think your big hitters in land torts are for sure private nuisance which is gonna be the question we're covering mainly I think it's a really big topic um it's just a big tort I think Rylands is like more of a niche tort um and public nuisance is even more niche in my opinion so your big hitters are your public nuisance and also trespass so very quickly um uh, wait i'm just going to stop for a second and just see if someone wants to quickly write in the chat what taught out of the word land torts do you want me to quickly cover knowing that we're mostly doing public private nuisance in the question i'll just give it like 15 seconds to see if someone's desperate to know one. Three, two, one, defamation. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got a defamation. All right, so maybe I just forget the land because I'm thinking, okay, actually, good point. Forget the land. We're going over that later. Let's do the words. I'm glad I asked. Thanks, Maria. Nice to um, see you as well um okay so we've got the word torts so I've got this little table here just first of all explaining the similarities and differences between the word torts so here we have statements that are made by the defendant and acted on by the plaintiff okay so for example with negligent misstatement if I'm the defendant I'm a lawyer for example, and I've made, I've given you a piece of advice that was negligent. You've relied on that advice. You've gone out and done something and you've lost. So I'm the defendant. I'm the lawyer. You acted on that advice. You're the plaintiff. Okay. Does that make sense? So the plaintiff is the subject. So yeah, the plaintiff is the person whose mind got influenced. Um, or for example, with deceit, it's like I made a statement that I knew wasn't true or I didn't give a crap if it was true or not. And I really intended to make you do something. You did that thing and you suffered loss. So I lied. You acted on that lie and you lost. So that is, yeah, your mind got altered because of that and you lost so the plaintiff is a the subject there you've got the other um this is just my categorization by the way I don't know if this is like a thing but this is just how I, it helps me figure it out so you've got statements made by the defendant and they're acted on by a third party but the plaintiff is the subject of the statements so for example with defamation let's say I'm the defendant 
and I say, um, Matt, Jerome, Joanne, Sonia, uh, all blah, 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 bad students. Sorry, <laughs> that's a weird example. But yeah, I just say something like really bad in the media. And so I've said something, the defendant, and then New Zealand or whatever audience who heard the statement and their opinion of you changes, that's the third party having their mind altered. But the plaintiff, if you want to sue me for that, is the subject of the statement. So that's the same with injurious falsehood so pass and passing off. So um, passing off being like basically before intellectual property was invented, we had this old tort of passing off. So it's like I'm a manufacturing company and I make fake Nikes you rely on the goodwill of Nike, like, you know, Nike's got a good reputation, so you buy them. But I falsely represented that I was Nike. I'm actually just Julie running my own little manufacturing company. So that's, yeah, defendant. I made Nikes. Um, someone in the public bought them thinking it was Nike, third party, and the plaintiff would be the company Nike suing me. Okay, and then you've got malicious or injurious falsehood, which is um, I, defendant, make a statement about someone's business or property. I make a statement about someone's business or property that causes someone else to not buy or not engage. So again, the third party's mind is being impacted. Okay, um, any questions before I go over? defamation and potentially negligent misstatement which I can see in the chat if we have time nope okay I'll keep going quickly all right so um defamation I love defamation because I used to be a journalist and defamation was always like omnipresent like will you get sued for defamation? So I've known about the tort of defamation for a long time and I really enjoy it. Um, FYI, I have been, people have threatened to sue me for defamation a lot, but I've never been sued for defamation. Um, okay, so yes, I could go over the elements. It's a defamatory statement. Um, and you know, there's different like bits and bobs of that. So what is a defamatory statement? The Defamation Act doesn't define it. So we look at common law. So, um, you know, like, let's say someone's being humorous. Um, you can still be defamatory if you're being funny. Um, if there's innuendo, like something subtle, but the audience would have understood it, then yes, this can be defamation. You can't go to court and be like, no, I, I didn't say that. It's like, if, if you're sarcastic and everyone knows, then it counts. So there's a bit of... Um, there's a bit of stuff to in regards to what is a defamatory statement. Element two is it has to be a defamatory statement about plaintiff. So the plaintiff doesn't have to be named. It just has to be obvious who's being referred to. Um, yeah, if you're defaming a group, a particular individual can bring the action. Um, all right, so we've got the defendant has to have published it. So publish can be not just like, I think the, my like cultural understanding of publish means like printed in a magazine, but publish could mean like words, like on a radio show, or it could mean a Facebook status. Um, it just needs to be like disseminated. I think that's probably a more accurate term. Mm. There's this, this, in this case, they like suggested, should we have a fourth element that there's a minimum threshold of seriousness? And so it's like, eh, maybe. So I've got that as like, a, eh, maybe. Um, all right. And then we've got, um, yeah, defenses. And this is where I want to spend the next minute or two because I think this is the most complicated part. So you've got your honest opinion and you've got truth. These are like, yes, as a journalist, you're like, well, I wasn't lying. It's true. So, um, 
unmute you, Felix, sorry. Yes, yeah, so um, it needs to be materially true, meaning not just like alum, um, yeah, uh, minor details, not a defense. So, okay, yeah, I don't have any more I want to add to that. Um, yeah, and if it's your genuine, honest opinion, that can be a defense. But the most complicated um, defenses, you're probably thinking or are confused about, I know I was. So you've got absolute privilege and qualified privilege. So absolute privilege is no matter what, you cannot be sued for defamation if you fit under this category. So for example, parliamentary proceedings. If you're sitting, if you're a member of parliament, and you walk into that circle-shaped room and you go take your seat, you can say whatever the hell you want. You can like fully insult, like say crazy stuff that's not true in any way. You can just go for it and you are not allowed to be sued for defamation. Same within judicial proceedings. Okay, so sorry if you can hear the baby noise. I don't know if you can. I promise there's a there's a babysitter. Um, yeah, so absolute privilege is privilege is more obvious and more straightforward. Your qualified privilege is it's a defense that you can get sometimes and that you can't get sometimes. So for example, if you're if you're a journalist and you report on uh, court proceedings. If your report of it is fair and accurate, then you get privilege and you can't be sued for defamation. But if your report is crazy and like doesn't really reflect what happened, then you could get sued. So you see how it's like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And in this Darian Gardner case, the Chief Justice Elias, uh, Chief Justice Winkelman, she was in the Court of Appeal at this time in 2018, and she led the judgment for this one. And I really liked her judgment. I thought she had good points. But um, she said you can get qualified privilege in New Zealand, mostly for journalists, if what you're saying is in the public interest. This is another one of my favorite defenses because, like, let's say you're really insulting a politician, um, but it's, like, in the public's interest to know because, you know, they're representing us, we voted for them, we're paying for them. We should know who they are. We should know their character. They like represent New Zealand. So you can say, um, yes, this might have been a defamatory statement, but it was in the public interest. So there are a few factors to consider in regards to whether it would be you would get um, qualified privilege for it being in the public interest. And one is the seriousness of the allegation. Then you'll need more um, due diligence required. The degree of public importance um the tone of the publication like if it's a really serious news um newspaper versus like I don't know whale oil beef hooked <laughs> I don't know or like some um yeah radio show that's like jokey like George FM I don't know I just thought of that one because my brother works there anyway yeah so that's qualified privilege and so the remedies are also a bit tricky um you don't need to show actual loss because sometimes if you have your reputation damaged, you can't like point exactly like this person was going to buy from me, but then they heard that radio report and then they thought I was a crap person. So then they didn't buy from me. So you can't, you can prove actual loss. Like if you can, that's good. But if not, you just have to prove like likely loss. So the courts are kind of guessing here at like how much you're worth and how much this damaged your reputation and how many people do we think sort of saw that um so yeah and did you do anything to mitigate like did you go out in front of the public and were like hey I did not actually have those relations with that woman <laughs> or did you just like um yeah make things worse so that counts if uh, it helps if you've mitigated your damage yeah and sometimes the court will give like damages that are punishing 
Like if you've done something really wrong and they want to punish you, they'll give you punitive or exemplary damages. Okay, I um I see we have gone a little bit longer than I would have wanted to, but um someone's just wrote negligence, ACC, trespass to person, common law privacy. Ah, I don't think that's too much for me to cover right now. Um I am going to jump into the problem question now because this will take a bit of time. And if we have time at the end, we can visit some of those topics or I'll answer more questions. So I got the question. So I hope everyone's had the chance to read the question. Um, basically, it's an open-ended question, like with the whole advice. Um, so you don't know exactly what to talk about oh um sorry I'm trying to mute someone uh why is that not muting I might have to stop sharing my screen to mute people oh there we go all right so would someone like to jump in with how you would start with answering this problem question and I'm just gonna leave like an awkward couple minutes pause um not not a couple of minutes, probably like 20 seconds of uncomfortable pause while I wait for someone to jump in. I would try and establish private nuisance. Thank you, Gary. Yes, great start. Me too. Yep, I would try and establish um, private the nuisance. Que the question in, on this is the same thing on the... Um, how to structure a legal problem it's the same thing yes it is exactly um okay so if you have already bought my guide and read it hmm maybe I'll ask you to come in as a last resort if the others who haven't read it can jump in first because I do give the answer in the guide so I should have um probably thought that through but I just wanted to give the best one okay so we would start with private nuisance. How would you go about, would you guys first list the elements of private nuisance or would you try and answer as you go and list the elements as you go? Gary would do number two, list them as you. The, se the second option. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think you can do either. I mentioned this in my guide too um but yeah okay so I'll go back to my notes so to establish private nuisance so I like private nuisance because it, I always think of that show neighbors at war I don't know if that's still around but I remember watching that when I was like 12 and there'd be like really grumpy neighbors who were like complaining over really trivial things like they built their fence too close and their dog is always barking so like to me, that is private nuisance. It's just, um, yeah. And if you haven't seen them already, go onto YouTube and type in Professor Alan Beaver. He's got amazing videos on private nuisance. Um, anyway, yeah, so private nuisance is, we're thinking neighbors at war. We're thinking, um we're thinking a continued and unreasonable and substantial interference with a person's right to use or enjoy the interest in their land. So we're talking about land here. We're not talking about someone personally being annoyed, but we're talking about like the value of land being decreased or like objectively anyone living on that land would be annoyed by what's happening. So what you need to prove nuisance you need a state of affairs. That means it can't be a one-off. It's got to be happening again and again and again. You need an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of someone's land. I'm going to underline that with my voice, land, land, land. Um, so there's two categories. We've got like a test and a test. Uh, the first category is direct injury to land. So if the land is literally being touched like someone spills oil and it's actually touching the land or if someone 
like I don't know burns your land frequently every day yeah I don't know maybe that's a farming reference then that's automatically unreasonable don't need to prove it if the nuisance is affecting your senses so like you think your neighbor's too loud you think they're too um their property is ugly like it's a visual eyesore or like generally something's emanating like maybe smoke um maybe they've got like big uh glass mirrors that are reflecting into your building it's emanating so if that's the case you're going to need to prove that it is um an unreasonable effect on your senses so there's a reasonable test when it comes to if something's affecting your senses and as always with torts it's like what would a reasonable person think so it's like what would be intolerable based on societal standards so that's the test um it needs to number three is it needs to come from the defendant's land so we're again we're in the land torts we're talking land land a to land b it needs to damage the plaintiff's land um so a person needs to have a sufficient interest in the land to be able to bring the claim they need to either own it or possess it so be renting it or yeah have some sort of interest in it and there are a couple defenses like if you're allowed to in law you're sweet and remedies i'd say generally damages money but if you can't be adequately compensated with money the courts will do an injunction and get involved so starting from our problem question so uh element one do we have a state of affairs Got something in the chat yes and yes all right tanya or pt do you want to jump in and say why or does someone else want to don't want to put you on the spot did i say the drain continuing to be blocked yeah. sorry the pipe the pipe not the drain yes and why do you think that is a state of affairs and not just a one-off block of that pipe um because with their knowledge that the tree is blocking it for so long yeah that's continued and they haven't stopped it or anything so it's continuing yeah causing more risk i guess yes yes i like that it's been going on it's continuing it's not just a one-off it's been happening for ages yep can anyone think of a case that's similar to that situation? Sidley. Yes, nice. Yes, so that was like a slightly surprising judgment for some people in some ways. But yeah, there was a council that put down a drain, it flooded, and it was like, isn't this like a one-off flood? But the fact that the drain was blocked for a long time means that it was a state of affairs the drain being blocked was a state of affairs so thank you so much that was great um yeah okay so state of affairs done let's go to element two so we've got an unreasonable is this an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of julie's land We'll say yes from Tanya. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happened is direct injury. So yes. Yeah. Sweet. 
Yep, we don't need to spend too much time on that. Yes, Tanya, and yes, Anne. Um, yep, there's oil that's built on the land. Done. Easy. Um, a similar case. Let's just say St. Helens melting, right? Damage to the land itself. Boom. Automatically unreasonable. All right, what have we got? Element three. Was it coming from the defendant's land? So, we haven't clarified, but um, EOL would be the defendant. I think they're the only possible defendant in this scenario. So is it coming from their land? Yep, it's on their land. Thanks, Annalise. Yep. Yep, it's on their land. Um, so they didn't directly cause the block. Some local hippies did. Um, but yeah, it's on their land. So what do you think about the fact that they didn't create it, but they knew about it and it's on their land? Does anyone have like a point to raise about that? They didn't abate it. Yes, exactly. Yep. It became their responsibility, even though they didn't create it. All right. And after this, we've got element four. It caused damage to the plaintiff's land. Okay. Did it, did it cause damage to Julie's land? Yep. Yep, damaged property. Yep. Um, okay. Any defenses that they could think of? Were they allowed to by statute? Um, probably not. Okay, let's go to the remedies. So what do you think, Julie? I shouldn't have used my name. It kind of feels weird. Anyway, what do you think Julie could recover? We've got a couple different things that she's complaining of. What do you think could be recovered? Damages as the computer and the tutoring business, 2K for the computer. All right. I want to ask, yes, I think the computer is fair. Why would you say to the tutoring business? Is this a, um, is this what you would call, um, wait, I just want to check the name of something else. Um, these are my semester one notes. So um yeah, there's different loss loss principles, right? Like when you directly have something that's um been damaged, that's like pretty straightforward but if what if something is damage like to some potential future earning like ah oh, this is what I'm looking for pure economic loss so um consequential economic loss what do you guys think is this um my potential future earnings does this count like can I claim for this Maybe I should have explained it better. So 
Um, okay. So the computer is relational economic loss because it's a financial loss. Like I've lost the value of two grand because my property is damaged. The second one is a consequential economic loss. So basically because I don't have the computer, I can't do my business. So it's like a loss of potential future earnings, but it's because of property being damaged. So that's easier to claim for. Pure economic loss, which is financial loss arising from no property damage. This is tricky. Like in the UK, you can't claim for it. In New Zealand, you can. All right. So um, that's pretty much covered the 2K and the potential lost earnings of 2K. And what about the digital course? Oh, I've got someone in the chat, Maria. Oh, I've got a few people in the chat. Gary, foreseeable loss. Is it foreseeable? Yes, good point. Um, and arguably under diminish of the use and enjoyment of the land. Would loss of chance be relevant? Oh, good questions. Okay. Um, I want to know what you mean by this, Maria. Arguably diminish um, the use and enjoyment of the land. Could you elaborate more with um, in the chat or... Or it's talking up to you. Um, we've also got Annalise who brings up a good point. Would loss of chance be relevant? Um, yes. Could you also? Hmm. Yes. I'll check on that. Well, no, it's... Yeah, so... Um, yeah, that's a good point. It's actually something I didn't think of, but I think it would be relevant to bringing up. Um, so... Yeah. Um, loss of chance. So it's like... Um, they come up a lot in those cases about uh, how do you say that where it's like my fibroma like when you get a little speck of the um asbestos on you um so in those cases it was like you have to prove that it was 50 percent more likely that that came from one company so in this situation it's like you'd have to prove that it's 50 percent or more likely that I would win but I think that's like slightly different because um like in those other cases it's like yes I have oh I can't remember how to say it, my fibuloma or something anyway I've got this thing and I'm trying to prove who caused it um this one might not yes I guess there is a loss of chance but it's not like um it's not like I have Mm. it's not mm. Mm. let me get my thinking clear before I just speak yeah so we're not trying to prove it was some more likely than not that someone caused that we're, we're trying to prove that I would win um, or that's yeah, and what do you think? Do you think that it would be very easy to prove that I would win? Yes, and we've got Hugh also saying she was negligent, not backing it up. Yeah, whether she would have won the 20K is speculative. Yep, thank you. That is a good one. Yep. Lots of chance of competition would be hard to argue, but worth a mention for sure. Yep. And I don't think I explained that very well. So apologies for that, but I definitely think it would be for sure with mesothyloma asbestos thing thank you <laughs> yep um yeah for sure um let me check uh if we've covered everything um yeah so 
Okay. I was getting my thinking confused. Um, loss of chance. Yeah, she can't necessarily claim for this, like we're saying. Um, I was getting the mice with the loan of being confused with loss of chance. That wasn't loss of chance. That's like proving 50% more. It's more likely than not that that person caused your damage. This is just a straight chance and you can't generally claim for that. So that wouldn't be recoverable. Um, is there any other uh, damage? What about like my lack of sleep, which I have been getting a lot of recently. So <laughs> with the baby, not because this scenario. Um, yeah, would I be able to claim for lack of sleep? And stress. Okay, because there's a land board, damages need to be justified or related to the use and enjoyment of the land. Yes, very good. Nice, Maria. Yes. Is stress general damages? Is that personal damage? Yeah, really good. Um, yes, so... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So Maria, you're right there. And if you want to um, have an authority, do you know where an authority for that statement might come from? Your law is correct. Can anyone think of a case? And it's to do with an animal. Lawrence Finn, tigers. Okay. Um, and is stress general damages um yeah there's this thing in torts where like if um yeah no sorry I'm not going to talk about this more yes it's not related to land and it's not an injury to the land it's injury to the person so it doesn't count okay let's move on to the next cause of action so is there any other cause of action you would bring up if this were your exam question might bring up rylands yep thanks gary all right so what do we need to prove rylands this i can just quickly someone's brought something onto their land it's a non-natural use of the land the thing is inherently dangerous it is escaped and it's caused damage to the land, the damage is foreseeable. So what do we think about our scenario? What has been, has anything been brought onto the land? The collection of water. Yes. Nice. Yep. Collection of water being brought on the land. Yep. And going to, um, is it a non-natural use of the land? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Why do you think it's a non-natural use of the land, Gary? Feel free to jump in with talking i'm gonna because excess amounts of water is not a regular use of the excess amounts of water wouldn't be considered a proper use of the land unless you were building like a swimming pool mm -hmm. okay yeah good answer um 
yeah i don't recall anything in the facts being like there's an excessive amount of water i think it was just that the pipe was blocked which built up the water um but hey there might have been because there's like an oil cleaning business so if it were to be shown that there was an excessive amount of water then yeah that would potentially be a non-natural use of the land um it's similar to can anyone think of a case where this scenario is similar to in Rylands? Yep. Yeah. Hamilton and Papakura. Okay, yes. Yep. Wasn't the one I was thinking of, but yes, it is similar. Yep. In my head, I'm thinking of Transca. So it's like a council pipe burst. Um, and they were saying the quantity of water is normal. So there was nothing out of the ordinary. So it wasn't an unnatural use of the land. Um, but if there were like a crazy weird amount of water, then it might have counted. Okay. So what else have we got in Rylands? Um, just quickly, the thing it must escape. Yes, that's escaped. Cause damage. Yes, foreseeable. We've been over that. Some like maybe the um loss of chance. Yeah, the competition is not foreseeable, and you would think someone would back that up. So, say on balance, Rylands probably I would say probably fails. Um. But definitely, if this is your exam question, go through each of the elements quickly. Bring everything up, even if you think it fails. Okay. Uh, just have a couple, like, three-ish minutes to talk about the, are there any other causes of action that you might bring up to finalize this question? I'll race through this because I want to give you guys some time to ask me questions. Um, so I would personally bring up trespass because trespass can be, yeah, trespass to land, uh, like not just trespass of people, but trespass of goods or stuff. So I would say like the water arguably could be trespassing because um, it's, you know, physically intruding onto someone else's land. But would do you think this would succeed? That's not really. Point. Yeah, not really. Yes. Uh, why do you think that? Um, because of the event, it's not deliberate. Like no one knew that there was going to be a storm, so it doesn't meet that first element. Yeah. Perfect. Sweet. Done. Nice. Yeah. Really well said too. Thank you for that. Yeah, not deliberate, not intentional, um, which you need for the trespass. Cool. So um, that covers the problem question. Um, an act of God. Oh, yeah, good thinking. Um, yeah, that's potentially comes into, uh, yeah, I feel like that relates to, um, hmm. Yeah, I guess so. An act of God. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, like the the storm could be considered an act of God. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, it act of God normally relates to like proving the chain of causation in my head. Um, but I guess it's like I think what you're saying with it is there's no deliberate act. It's like no one like went and chucked the water on. It was just a random act of God or some random thing. So it doesn't count as deliberate. I think that's what you're saying. Um, okay. So how about an action and negligence? Yeah, nice. I like that for sure. Yeah. Um, I think for completeness of the answer. Yeah. I think you could bring up negligence. Yeah. Um, all right. Nice. All right. Hey. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, Julie, could I ask a question about a possible defense for EOL being their ethical beliefs, not being able to cut down the tree? Mm -hmm. Like what would the what would 
that come under. Ooh. That's the reason why they didn't, since ethics is quite important to their party, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. And one I have to be honest, I didn't think of. So well done, PT. Sorry, I call you PT. Your initials. That's um, okay. <laughs> I thought I might just not put my name because it's going on YouTube. Yeah, fair. Yeah, fair. Um, okay, because of the ethics. Um, I have to think about that. And if anyone wants to jump in with an idea too, I'm open because I haven't pre-thought that. Um, I would just like think about how it relates to the elements. I don't know if there's any like specific defense relating to um like ethics um all good if it's it's just curious yeah no it's a really good question um yeah I mean I don't know I think it would probably come into this whole like Torts is always going back to the reasonable person and what would a reasonable person do um yeah and I would say like mm, it'd probably come under like them being unreasonable yeah it might be like even a policy consideration because if they allowed that then everyone might say oh that was my ethical right mm -hmm. and then like everyone's going to argue that and it'll cause more problems I guess yes really good thinking especially if you go into negligence yes thank you so interesting glad yeah thank you for bringing that up um okay we've got about like nine minutes left of this of this session does anyone have like a general question about torts or just like exam i don't know gary um i'm just covering uh covering um common law privacy mm, mm, yeah. it's just some um elements of it is a highly offensive highly offensive public publicity mm. so and the objective test is whether the publicity given to the private facts in the center in the in question mm -hmm. would be considered highly offensive would be considered highly offensive to an objective reasonable person and then i've noted that it's determined by cat that that objective person is determined by case law and are there any like cases that might be helpful okay um yeah i think we're talking about wrongful publication of private facts here so that comes from the case hosking ranting mike hosking sued um someone running for taking photos of his children when they were out on the street so this tort didn't exist in New Zealand before this time and Hosking was a test case in that the questions were both does this tort exist do we recognize this tort in New Zealand and if so does he win so does anyone want to uh, we're running out of time maybe I have to be quick okay. uh Oh, he, yeah, no, I think he he it did it did recognize the tort of it did yep yep and um he lost so you're saying are there any more examples of um what would be considered highly offensive yes they give some examples in the case they say if the information is very personal and private and would be truly humiliating distressful or otherwise harmful um if the publication is widespread, if it, and you don't need to show that it's um, proved economic or like genuine psychiatric loss, like you don't need to have gone to a mental home to be, oh, sorry, that was very insensitive way to put that. Mm, I'm sleep deprived, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, you don't need to prove genuine psychiatric loss in order to claim. So yeah, I think the thing to focus on here would be truly humiliating, distressful, otherwise harmful. And here it was just a photo of his kids out and about. Like there's nothing actually humiliating about that. It's not like anyone wasn't wearing clothes. It wasn't just like someone was having a quick pee behind the corner. Like it was um, it was not considered offensive. Um, and yeah, anyone walking out on the street can see Hosking's kids in their pram. So like it's not private. All right, thanks for that question, Gary. Does anyone have another question? It 
So does that, is that kind of saying like, it's more about the publicity of those private facts, not the facts itself? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, Yeah, so to prove this, Todd, um, there's two elements. Sorry about the noise. There's the existence of facts where there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's what we've just been talking about. And then, oh, wait. Oh, wait. That's not covered. The research don't blah, 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 blah. Um, Publicity. There it is. Thank you. Publicity given to those facts would be considered highly offensive. Yes. So it's like you've got private facts and you've publicized it. Um, publicity, from my memory, it doesn't need to be like massively publicized. It needs to be like disseminated somehow. Um, I'd be curious to see like a Facebook status case um, and how that would be interpreted. Does that answer your question? Sorry. I got yep. To yep. That's <laughs> all good. Thank you. <laughs> um, how would you apply section six defamation? Thanks, Annalise. Let me check this out. Um, okay. Um, let me find it. Um, okay, so we're talking about um, it, that element two, that the statement needs to somehow identify the plaintiff. Um, and you need to show that it caused monetary loss or would likely cause monetary loss. How would you prove that? Um, oh, I'm trying to remember a case where they were talking about, um, there's like a whole calculation thing they go into. I think it's the one with Shadbolt, um, that politician. Um, and they're saying like, yeah, you can like tally up someone's assets, tally up, like how much they generally make um, and like basically how much their good reputation is worth. And then it's like non-scientific, but the courts are saying like, we have to try and figure out how damaging the statement was in the context. So from memory, it's like, um, let's say someone's whole life is like being a politician and to be a politician, your job is like obviously for people to trust you like you need people to trust you and like you to have to do your job so if the statement was like incredibly damaging and no one would ever hire you again oh, I mean elect you again so you never have a job in your field again like you could roughly tally up how much that could be worth so like how much lost earnings you would have before you found another job like you kind of have to I remember um, reading about this, like just trying to roughly figure that out. It's really hard to, but the courts were like open about the fact that this is very subjective and it's some, and they just have to recognize that it's not a scientific, um, yeah, not a scientific way. There's no scientific way to prove that because like no human being could ever prove that. Um, so we've got about two minutes left. If you did enjoy the session before you sign off, if you wouldn't mind writing a testimonial in the chat, and I'd, if you don't mind, like to use your first name and the testimonial just to promote future webinars, like maybe on my social or my website, my socials. Um, yeah, and yeah, just thank you so much for coming. I have had so much fun talk about torts one of my favorite subjects um if you would like to get my notes for torts or any of the my other notes i have the um the 10 torts 10 off that's my discount code that i've made which is good till midnight tonight i've just uploaded a document which says the discount code in case you feel like you might forget it i'm like one of those I need to write everything down because I might forget it type people um also if you don't have my 
um, how to make free notes guide, I highly recommend downloading it. Um, I was, yeah, I have received so many downloads of this. Um, that's the paid one, which talks about, which has our model answer. Here it is. Yeah. I highly recommend downloading it. It's free. Why not? So yeah, when I was at uni, it took my husband and I so many hours to think of like, what is the most effective way to structure legal exam notes? How can you put cases, um, like, oh yeah, how can you in an exam seamlessly weave cases in and out of an answer? So we spent a lot of time in coffee shops talking and thinking about this and, yeah, I went back and just distilled the method and how I made all my notes and I just made it free because I wanted you guys to be able to make your own as well. Um, so go for that. And yeah, thank you for the, thank you, Maria, for your comment. Um, is your model answer suitable to an exam question? It asks for you to advise the person. Yes, it is. Yes. I I wanted to make it one of those sort of vague ones on purpose because I think those are the hardest to figure out how to structure because if they're like would he succeed in Rylands you know to go straight to Rylands and just apply it um but the advised ones I feel like it can get confusing for people like do you list all the elements first and then do you repeat them like there's just so many things to think about and when I was studying, I really, really thought, pre-thought all this. So I had a game plan. I didn't waste any time in an exam deciding like, oh, do I write the elements now or later? Or how do I apply? Do I do I like? Do I not? Should I? So um, I write all that in the, I explain my method in that guide. Um, and also just like, I used to be a lecturer in communication studies. So I have tips on like I've been a marker. I know what goes through markers' heads when they're reading exams. So I give these little tips as well. All right, that's the end of the session. Thank you all so much. Um, yes, yeah, so nice to talk to you all and good luck with your exam study. I'm sure it is a very stressful time, but um, I hope that you are, yeah, getting through it, smashing it, making some progress and yeah, good luck with your TOLTS exam.